Good morning. This is uh, Friday, April 2nd, 2021. Thank God it's Friday. We're taking up H-128, which is an act relating to limiting criminal defenses based on the victim's identity. And uh, we have Bryn here, who's from Legislative Council, and the committee. Uh, hopefully to discuss it. Senator Nitko will be joining us soon, I hope. And, uh, Bryn, is there any, are there any proposed amendments to the bill? Oh, good morning, committee. For the record, Bryn Hare from Legislative Council. Um, so when you took up the bill last week, you took a look at uh, some language that I put together while you were hearing testimony. Mm -hmm. um, I can put that back up on the screen so you can look at it again um, yep. to see if that addresses some of the concerns that um, were raised by committee members and the witnesses. Would you like it if I shared my screen? to, to Yes, it would refresh my memory. Um, I'm sure the rest of the committee remembers everything. Okay. And Peggy, I'll send this to you also to post because there is some highlighting in this version. <clears throat> So if you remember the way that the um, bill as it came over to you from the House looked, there were two subsections. There was subsection A and subsection B. And A dealt with what kind of evidence was um, prohibited from being introduced in a criminal prosecution. And B um, provided that you couldn't introduce certain, a certain type of evidence to mitigate the severity of the offense, which you heard testimony was really about the sentencing phase. So. Um, and you also had quite a bit of discussion about that um, language about in, in evidence of a non-forcible or non-violent romantic or sexual advance by the victim. <clears throat> um, so I tried to address those three issues in this um, language. You looked at it a little bit last week. Um, here it is again. So I combined A and B into one, um, just one provision here. So, and I've added, or sentencing at the beginning. So now it reads in any prosecution or sentencing for a criminal offense, the following types of evidence can't be used as a defense to the defendant's criminal conduct, to establish a finding the defendant suffered diminished capacity, to justify defendant's use of force against another person. And then I added, or to otherwise mitigate the severity of the offense. Good, and, Brent, just mm -hmm. quickly, you. You read in the first line in any prosecution? In a, I like, in a, oh, sorry. In a. I like better if it does say in any. Um, but now it says in a. Okay. Yeah, I didn't, if I said any, I meant to say a. Anyway. I just think any goes better with sentencing. Good. Okay. Just anyway. I'll make a note of that. A little nervous about sentencing being added. I'd like to hear from the Defender General, but I'm just, I understand why you wouldn't want it in a trial before a jury, but when you get to a sentencing phase, even if a, um, well, there are always aggravating versus mitigating circumstances that are argued, and it's up to a judge to decide whether something is appropriate or not appropriate in the circumstances. If we are disarming the ability of a defendant to make an argument in sentencing for whatever reason, that always makes me nervous. And I'm not sure how this would fly with the defense bar. So Dick, I'd like to hear from somebody in the defense bar uh, to talk about this. Unfortunately, the defense bar is not here. And uh, I trust that we can, uh, where is the sentencing in the other? Uh, it's in, there's no word or sentencing in the in the version that came over from the house. It was in subsection B. You heard some testimony from the witnesses that that sub, subsection B that said that um, evidence of certain evidence shouldn't be introduced to mitigate the severity of the, the offense was referring to the sentencing phase. And can I ask a question? I'm, I am looking at my copy and what I have is as introduced. I don't have as passed. Oh, I do. I mean, 
as introduced was sent to me, not as passed. But well, you need to go I, online and get and uh, print it. Yeah, I will. I was. Part, <clears throat> but but um, yes, if you could, Peggy, uh, if if they're available. In fact, they're all everything that was sent to me was as introduced. So I guess they're not any good. Well, the, the defense bar, spoke, um, Rebecca Turner testified that she opposes the bill. Um, the defender mm -hmm. general uh, opposed the bill no matter what. Mm -hmm. And um, however, the, as defense, so I, um, against uh, lower sentencing, it's resulting in no data that this defense is uh, used in Vermont, um, which is sentences naturally have resulted in uh, our much harsher sentences. Um, I, you know, if we can, uh, even if we can't get a hold of her, I know what her testimony is. And Joe, you're um, correct that the defense bar opposes the use of the word sentencing. They oppose the bill anyway. But well, I knew they opposed the bill. We were talking then, though, my memory is correct <clears throat> about the trial stage, not the sentencing stage. Right. And so, I'm, I'm, um, well, we, we should. Okay. We, could we continue looking through and if we want to add sentencing or take it out? That was suggested by some of the witnesses. If I had Alice Nitka here, I'd know exactly which witnesses suggested that. Well, David sure did, and Rebecca Turner did not. No, she did. She did. Oh, oh, about sentencing, you mean? Yeah. Yeah. She was opposed to the, she's opposed to the, the defender general is opposed to the bill. Right. Because there is no problem. But, but excuse me. Perfect. What problem is the problem trying to get at? And there's no evidence of a problem in Vermont. Is her, that's my, my, that's what I wrote down from her testimony. Alice has much better notes, but she's not here yet. And also they just opposed removing any defense right. um, as a matter of principle. So um, we need to decide during markup, which is what we're doing. Uh, should we add sentencing or not? Um, okay, and you added otherwise mitigate the severity of the offense. Right. So <clears throat> as I mentioned, I put in, I put, I collapsed. Andy, can it. you see if David Schur is available too? <clears throat> um, yep. I did send it to him. I can email again, but Rebecca just joined. Great. Thank you. Rebecca. And I, can I just throw in a thought here? Um, yeah. And I know that this won't make yeah. anybody happy, but I actually don't think I like the bill at all. Um, right. Just because I think that um, why would you eliminate the ability to use something as a defense and trust the jury and the judge to take that into account? Anyway, so I, I'm not sure that I'm happy with the bill at all, oh. whether it's sentencing or um, prosecution. Senator Baruf, did you want to respond to that? Sure. So um, my understanding of what this was trying to do was there, there has been historically, uh, you know, a, an entrenched prejudice against um, certain classes of people and um, people in the LGBT community um, are being uh, represented by this bill. And so the idea is people were being ex post facto were being given either no sentence uh, that is no conviction or a lesser conviction based on a shared prejudice um, with judges and juries um, so that they could make an argument that there was something so horrible about the gayness of the person who had been attacked that it forced them into a, uh, a, a violent rejection of that person and then 
you know, judges and juries here and there were saying, yeah, we can kind of understand that and going along with it. So what this bill is trying to do is take away that possibility from prosecutors and, and, uh, and judges to agree with a defense that there's something inherently, um, you know, productive of violence about someone's being gay. So, um, you know, I, I support the bill and I support what Bryn has done in terms of adding sentencing, because if you don't add sentencing or, or make it explicit that it includes sentencing, then you could have a judge who essentially buys the gay panic defense and circumvents what happened in the prosecution phrase, phase under this law. So if I can just have a moment to respond to that. I understand that, but yeah. I, but it hasn't, my, what I thought we heard from Rebecca was that the, those high profile cases, the three cases that Bohr gave us are, were the high profile ones. And indeed that is what happened. But when you look at the cases in general, that hasn't happened. And that's a small minority of, of sent, reduced sentences because of that defense. So if you look at, if, if we shouldn't be responding to high, necessarily to high profile cases, but to look at the totality of the cases. And, and, I, and I do understand that that's true. But so what if, what if I'm this nice white little woman and I get attacked by, um, or I think I'm getting, not attacked, but I'm, um, a black man is coming on to me and I say that, I, I, it just made me so nervous that I had to shoot him. I mean, shouldn't we, or um, a, a guy from, with a motorcycle jacket on was coming on to me. So I, I'm so afraid of motorcycle people because I know about the Hells Angels, so I had to shoot him. I mean, isn't, aren't we going down some kind of a, a slippery path here that- so, uh, Brynn okay. would like to- Okay, I'm sorry. On, and I'd like to bring this back, but Bryn, please, okay. and then so, I'm so going to ask Rebecca Turner to focus on the word on adding sentencing to the amendment. So um, the the other changes that have been made in the bill were intended to address that concern that was raised at the last the senator the concern that Senator White was just um, describing. <clears throat> so <clears throat> in order to address that concern, um, they I made some changes to subdivision one. So you remember before there was like a standalone um, category of evidence that couldn't be introduced. I've combined that into um, subdivision one here. So now it reads that evidence of defendants discovery of knowledge about or potential disclosure of the crime victims actual or perceived sexual orientation or gender identity, including under circumstances in which the victim made a non-forcible, non-criminal romantic or sexual advance towards the defendant. So I did that in order to make it clear that that type of evidence is only in the context of when um, the defendant is concerned about the potential discovery um, or knowledge about the victim's sexual orientation or gender identity. <clears throat> does that does that make sense yep. to everybody? Okay. Yep. As far as I'm concerned, my only the question that Joe raised about sentencing is what I'd like to hear from Rebecca Turner about if, whether that should be added or not added and what impact it has by adding prosecution or sentencing. I know that you, you're, that Rebecca, that the Defender General is opposed to the bill. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Chair. And, and uh, for the record, Rebecca Turner, from the uh, Defender General's office, and thanks for- um, Thank you for joining us on short notice. Thank you for looping me in, um, and I just, and um, Bryn, that was helpful to see it on the screen, um, and I don't actually have a copy of that Let me up on my screen, but I, I, if I recall, oh, here, thank you. <laughs> um, so yes, I think the impact of, of adding that language is to clarify, if there was any doubt, that this uh, categorical ban on consideration or, uh, on admissibility of this type of um, situation cannot be uh, considered at all in a criminal court proceeding, sentencing, prosecution. So I think that achieves that purpose. 
in terms of whether or not that changes um, my or the Defender General's office's uh, position on this bill, it doesn't, uh, as, as was, uh, was predicted. And, and again, it's reinforcing um, the reasons why we oppose it, uh, which is that, and I think some of the, I think it may have been even Attorney uh, Sher, Sher from uh, Attorney General's office or, or the prosecution's office, but at sentencing, um, there is, of course, a long tradition that we want the judge to have the maximum flexibility to consider all possible factors, all past possible uh, relevant information um, going into all the myriad of, of factors that that judge is weighing in terms of the various purposes of, of uh, choosing the right sentence for that particular individual, right? So it's both uh, maximizing discretion for the judge to consider all so we, he, she uh, can fashion the most appropriate sentence for that individual. For that to happen, you know, considering rehabilitative uh, possibilities, um, recidivism issues, deterrence, specific counseling needs, you know, risk to the public, every, every factor needs to be considered. And so that is where um, I think it is in a separate issue in terms of banning it categorically coming in at the, at the um, guilt and innocence phase of the case. But at sentencing, I think that this is a detriment overall to our system, to the public. Uh, again, we have a system where we trust uh, and give the judges wide discretion to uh, suggest that we somehow can't continue that trust in this particular area. I think, again, is sending a message that I don't think, and this was re repeated this morning, that there's any reason to be concerned. I know there were some isolated cases cited, although I'm not recalling if Four Yang was citing Vermont specific cases because I wasn't no. aware of any. Okay, thank you. Um, and so I think then that there, there is no reason. I think that the, the concerns raised this morning too as to a sort of a slippery slope, um, whenever something is, uh, is horrific and, and, and sh that we want to shun, right? That we don't like these attitudes, uh, these these actions, these these opinions coming in. Uh, it, there is a question of where will we start drawing the line, right? Um, because this could go into um, all sorts of realms. So no, for those reasons, um, I certainly, you know, particularly the latter part, which is also making clear in this section that it's only regarding, you not considering it for mitigating the offense, um, what that is setting up for is also sort of a skewing of, of, of sort of permitting a judge to and encouraging in a way implicitly a policy of pushing a judge to, to increase sentences to imprisonment. Again, why the distortion of policy without um, when we don't know the specific factors and circumstances in hand. Um, so I'll stop there. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, questions for Rebecca? I think it makes, uh, appreciate your willingness to come here on short notice. David, did you want to comment on the amendment that Bryn has put forward and uh, the issue of sentencing? Sure, Senator, thank you, and I apologize. Uh, Thanks for the short notice coming on. Appreciate it. No problem. Um, I've only been able to review briefly what is in front of you. My initial thought, and just thinking about this, you guys already know the AG's office's position on this. We support the bill uh, and support it as it came over from the House and happy to work with you on, on amending language here. So looking at it from a technical standpoint, my first thought is just that I'm not entirely sure that it this amendment addresses Senator Benning's concerns around uh, how certain types of conduct, like physical conduct, as opposed to beliefs, um, might still be a viable defense without, or, a, or a, a defense that should be available. Um, again, we're talking about conduct, not what's in somebody's head, not the hateful beliefs that we don't want to become part of a defense. And I'm not sure if this is addressing that concern. I, I understand that it's it's it, the way in which it's changed. I think, but I'm just not sure if it was it was responsive to Senator Benning's concern. That would be my only my only point on this as something for the committee to consider. But of course, if this is the direction the committee wants to go in, we wouldn't oppose that either. Uh, I like the format that she's presented. My only question is where the sentencing should be added or not. 
Again, we don't we don't oppose have this version of it. I think it's fine to explicitly include sentencing. It is doing it in a way that um, puts everything together in a way that the prior draft separated out the sentencing phase in a way that I thought might address some of Senator Benning's concerns around uh, certain types of conduct, not what's in somebody's head, still being a plausible defense in the trial phase. But I also, I'm coming in quickly here. So if uh, attorney- yeah, Harris, understood. I, understood. I, I, uh, Just, I will defer. May I ask David a question? Yeah. Yes, please. So, um, I, I maybe maybe I completely misunderstood um, Joe's concern here. I thought that he did not want sentencing in here because sentencing is that we want to give the judge maximum information during the sentencing process. So I'm confused about why you would think that adding this in was um, somehow meeting Joe's concerns. Let, let me make sure you understand my concern, David. First off, there's two phases of a criminal prosecution here. First is the trial, where a jury is going to make a decision. The second is the sentencing phase, where a judge is going to make a decision. I was somewhat sympathetic with the idea of language uh, prohibiting a defense in a criminal trial phase because I saw some wisdom in society trying to block that as an excuse. A judge, on the other hand, I've been through the judge reviewing process, nominating process five times. You are grilled. We don't pick judges who have biases. We pick judges who are able to understand uh, where things should and should not come into play when making a sentence and argument. If I'm a, a, a criminal defendant that has grown up in the Westboro Baptist Church, all of us may agree that, in fact, we don't want those kinds of people being produced in society. But the fact of the matter is I'm a defendant in a situation where all of my mindset is the Westboro Baptist Church. And in a sentencing phase, a judge may have before him or her options for how to address programming needs. But for me as a defense attorney to be stripped of the ability to say, judge, there's reason X, Y, or Z as to why there should be some consideration for how this individual was uh, programmed to be in this position. And what do we do to, about that? Do we warehouse them or do we provide them programming in a probation situation of some kind? I, I find it very uh, unfortunate that this language has come up at this point. And I'll back up to say, I was all in favor of a judge being given the ability during trial phase to have a jury instruction that the jury could not consider um, any of these particular elements being addressed here for the very reason Philip talked about, uh, of society learning how to reject these kinds of defenses. Uh, but when you get to sentencing, that's a whole nother ball game for me, and, and I, I just can't go along with this. Uh, Mr. Chair? Yep. So um, I, I, I understand where Joe's coming from, and, and also Rebecca, and I, I think that that's in general, that's not an argument I disagree with, but I, I feel as though we do this a lot where we say, well, people in other parts of the country have problems with uh, uh, violence, prejudice, et cetera, but not here in Vermont. And you know, so when Joe says that we don't pick judges with bias here, of course we do. Um, you know, I, I'm not gonna specify particular bias, but I think we all understand now that when we talk about systemic bias, we're saying that legislators have bias, judges have bias, juries have bias. And as a society, we're trying to figure out how to manage these things. So if we create a hardcore separation between prosecution and sentencing, and we say, we're not gonna allow this defense and prosecution, but then we give a single judge the ability to uh, implicitly or explicitly by this defense, 
and bring the sentence down accordingly, then I think our work has been defeated um, in a way that Bryn's draft wouldn't allow. So, um, you know, I, I don't think, I, I think Vermont is a wonderful place. I think we have less violence and bias than in other places, I'll be honest. But, but we do have our problems too. And this, I think, seeks to, um, to speak to something that people in this community have been worried about for good reason because they've seen trials, um, or Yang mentioned the high profile ones where people's sentences are mitigated because the person says, I discovered this person's sexual orientation and it was that disorienting that I had to attack them. So, so the, the first draft, and I, and, and I wanna be um, clear, so Bryn, correct me if I'm wrong, the first draft did include sentencing, it just didn't make it explicit. So if we went back to the house language, we would still be including sentencing. This draft just makes it explicit. Am I right in that? Mm -mm. Oh. Yeah, so it's my opinion, opinion that the house version did include sentencing. It didn't yeah. use the word sentencing, but subdivision B provided you can't um, introduce certain types of evidence to mitigate the severity of the defense, of the offense. Okay. And um, it was my testimony, I think it was the testimony of others that that really indicated the sentencing phase. Okay, so in, so in that, if I could just finish, Jeanette. So yep. I, in that case, I, I think the House decided on including sentencing. Um, and so I think that's a, a fair question for us to pick up. Um, but if we went back to their language, it would still be there. If it's gonna be there, I would prefer that it be clear and explicit. Could, um, do we, I know that there are certain things that aren't allowed in um, in a jury trial, like hearsay evidence and stuff like that. There, there are certain things that are disallowed. Do we do we disallow anything else to come before the judge? I mean, do we say you can't take into account their their poverty level, or you can't take into account their you can't hear, is there anything else that we tell a judge that you can't, you can't listen to when you're um, about to sentence them? Um, well, there's the, we have a rape shield statute that prohibits evidence about um, a victim's sexual history from being introduced. Right. But that's the victim, not the defender, the defense, right? Or would right. that be used as a defense if, if it was allowed. Yeah, I, I get you. Um, is that the only one you think? Um, you know, I, I don't want to say that that's the, the only the only one. Um, Rebecca, rather... Rebecca, did you want to comment on that question? I did. Thank you for the opportunity to respond. Uh, there is, as, as I understand the reading of this bill, the judge would not be able to consider this where you reference hearsay, the Rape Shield Act, there are, there are um, pieces which prohibit it, but a judge gets to consider whether or in fact it falls within the category, right? And, and it comes in, um, but not based on the subject, but Rape Shield. And you're talking about the um, guilt, uh, the trials phase of the case um, at sentencing, uh, you're right, Senator Way about hearsay, um, but otherwise it is extraordinarily ex expansive in terms of what can be considered. Jessica, did, from the network, did you wanna speak? Sure, thank you so much, Chair and Committee. Jessica Barquis from the Vermont Network. And I will just say that um, we wholeheartedly support the, the language changes that Bryn has made. Um, you know, I, I hear some of the concerns and I will just reiterate that we feel like it is never okay to say that a victim's identity is to blame for a defendant's violent reaction. Um, and Bryn is very um, right in saying that this, this language and this concept is very similar to our rape shield laws, which work very well for our, um, our system. So thank you. Uh, Mitty? 
we have to make a decision. I like Bryn's changes. I support the changes, um, but I go with the majority of the committee on whether or not to add sentencing. I mean, if you don't like the bill, you're certainly welcome to vote against it. I, um, you know, I, I do want to comment that just because it hasn't been used here doesn't mean it won't be. I remind people all the time when they used to say, well, there's never been a shooting in a workplace in Vermont, that there was one in Bennington. It just happened in 1993 before all the, you know, the current and issues. And also in, in Essex. And in Essex. And so there have been. Um, I, you know, I love sometimes, well, it can't happen here, attitude. It can happen here. Somebody could try to use this. However, um, I hear what Joe is saying about the sentencing phase, and we allow all kinds of things to come into the sentencing phase. It doesn't mean that the judge has to take into, that into account when deciding the sentence, or 99% of the cases anyway are, are plea bargain. So it's very rare that the judge overrides the plea bargain. Um, I know there was a recent case in Bennington County where the judge overrode the plea bargain and gave the guy 18 months because that's what one of his associates got. And he didn't think it was fair that this guy was going to get, I think, 12 months. I may be off. So the, the judge overrode the plea bargain by six months. Obviously not a huge deal, but the fact is that judges <clears throat> take into account a lot of things when doing sentencing. Um, I'm, I'm fine with the with keeping sentencing in as one member of the committee. Um, where Senator White? I would, I would not put sentencing in. And in fact, I would explicitly take it out because I think that, that, in the, that if we start prohibiting um, information that the judge can look at, and we're talking here about specific um, uh, victim identities, um, but there are all kinds of victim identities that could come in here that we could then tell the judge that you couldn't, you can't consider this. And if, if we, I, I fear that um, one of the things that Rebecca talked about was that um, having categorical exclusions for um, information to come to the judges is harmful and I do understand that Philip's concern that we we do have judges that have bias that is absolutely true but I think we have to put some trust in our in our judges and I'm okay with um, not I would prefer not having it um, excluded from the jury part of it either but I'm okay with that but I'm not okay with um, prohibiting the uh, judge from having the informa any information that um, is, could be presented. So that's where I am. Anyone else who's ready to make a decision? I'm ready to support the bill as drafted in the amendment. Excuse me, I'm ready to support the amendment as drafted by Bryn. Um, I'm, if the majority wants to take out sentencing, it's, I, I still support. I just, I'd like to back up if I could and make clear. Um, I completely agree all of us have biases and I shouldn't have worded it that way. When a nominating uh, committee goes through its decision-making process, they strive to find people who can take their biases, recognize their biases and be committed to setting aside those biases before they become a judge. We trust in those judges to do that. And when they don't, they come back before judicial retention and for that very reason uh, could be prevented from continuing on as a judge. One of the other things that we do in trying to go through a jury voir dire process is get people to recognize that they do indeed have biases, but can they commit themselves to setting those biases aside 
And if they can and clearly convince us of that, then we will agree to put them on a jury panel. I, am, I was approached several months ago by a constituent who is gay and was concerned about that, this issue. And I had never heard of the cases that we have talked about in this uh, committee testimony. I learned about that. And as a result of that, I agreed that a judge should be given the ability to issue a jury instruction at the time that the evidence is done or during the trial itself for that matter, be able to say this panic defense is not to be considered by the jury. So evidence could be blocked by the judge from coming in or the, and or the judge could issue a jury instruction before they go in to deliberate that would prohibit their considering uh, a gay panic defense. I can sympathize with that as a reason why society wants to move in the direction this bill wants to take us. I can't agree to a bill that is going to hamstring uh, the judicial process from imposing a sentence that is appropriate for a given criminal defendant. So I guess I'm opposed and I'll leave it there. Senator Baruch. <laughs> So to, just to complicate things uh, by 10, um, I support the bill as drafted and as um, amended by Bryn, um, and I support that strongly. What I couldn't support is taking the bill in a direction that is self-defeating. And I think <clears throat> if, we, if we change the House draft so that judges can in effect consider the gay panic defense, we've defeated the whole purpose of what we're doing. So I, I wouldn't support a version that eliminates the sentencing phase entirely, which is what I feel like we're discussing now. Mm -hmm. so, um, so I guess that's, that's where I am. It doesn't, it doesn't help move us toward a, uh, a compromise, but... Well, that's where we are. There's five of us. Um, I apologize for being late. I was on another. Okay. Didn't think we were going to start till nine. Sorry. Um, you want some time to think about this? I'm rereading all my notes. Yeah, we're, we're, we've got. Um, I'm not sure what that means, Peggy. We do need to go to uh, the next bill at 9.15 because um, we have witnesses who need to. Mm -hmm. Can we come back to this at, a, at 11? Bryn, are you available? Yep, that works for me. And, and Bryn, can you send me the new draft, please? Sure, sure. Thank you. Why don't we come back to this at 11 a.m. Um, and uh, anybody who's on the line now who would like to join us at 11. Uh, Mr. Chair, could, um, would I have a, uh, a constituent who's also a representative um, who was one of the sponsors of this bill? Would it be possible to get um, testimony from Taylor Small? Well, if we want to, you know, I, I've got so little time and I'm not sure how that would be helpful. Okay. I, I just don't know. I mean, I, we're limited time here. We're on a crunch. We've got 12 bills from the House, not counting the ones that are still coming. And, you know, this is... I was hoping if we can't finish today, then yes. It's highly irregular for us during markup to hear from a representative. Uh, what? I mean, I don't know, Senator. I don't know. Let me think about it. Uh, let's see how we go. Anyway. 
Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right, um, we're gonna turn our attention from H128, which was the simple little bill, to the more complex bill, S99, um, which is a bill that- I'll be right back. I just have to turn up my thermostat a little bit. It's freezing in my room. Oh, okay. Um, and, All right. Okay, we're gonna to switch to S99 um, and take more testimony um, from the survivors. Um, and today, yesterday we heard from the survivors of the St. Joseph's Orphanage. And today we're hearing from three survivors of the uh, current Hatton School in Wyndham County. Uh, and um, Kim is here to introduce us to the survivors. Um, and their testimony is on the website. And I want to, uh, before we start, just compliment. I've read all their testimony. And I want to just say how impressed I am with their courage in coming forward. The very personal stories about uh, what's happened to them what happened to them while they were at Kern Hatton and that Im the impact of those events on their lives um, and the bravery for using their first, their identifying uh, information. So, uh, I, my heart goes out to all three of you and all the other survivors of the abuse. And I don't know what else I can say other than we will try to do what we can to help you all. I think there's a template from the way the city of Burlington is treating um, the St. Joseph Orphanage case, which has the year. Um, I can't think of the group that's working with the survivors, in, as well as the Attorney General's office and others who are looking into the allegations. Kim, if you would please uh, introduce us to your uh, clients. Thank you very much, Senator Sears, for your kind words and observations. Uh, we really appreciate, oppor appreciate the opportunity to be here today. And, and, and you're right, it is very difficult and challenging for they and doing what they can to help others um, to ensure that childhood physical abuse in the future is deterred and that there's actionable ways to proceed against those who are culpable. We have three survivors today who went to Kern Hatton School for Children and they range in different time frames from when they were there. Uh, the first speaker will be William Gorski. He was formerly known as Davidson. He's going to share some thoughts with you about what happened while he was there and his observations and the way that it's impacted his life. Next, we will have Raymond Upton, who will speak regarding what's happened to him and the experiences he had and that he observed and also the impact that it's had on his life. And then finally, we'll end with Carolyn Blake Bashaw who is um, one of our uh, survivors from the longest time in the past. I want, I would, I, we don't want to age her or anything, but she's been through a lot and she's got a lot of experience that, um, that she'd like to share regarding herself and her siblings and the observations that she's had regarding friends there and how this has impacted her life as well. They all support this bill um, and they really appreciate Vermont for its leadership in eliminating statute of limitations that will help children in the future. So to Mr. Gorski. Thank you. Um, Mr. Gorski, welcome to Senate Judiciary. Um, my name's Dick Sears. I'm a state senator from Bennington County. Uh, the vice chair will introduce himself and then uh, go around the room. Uh, I'm Senator Phil Baruth from Chittenden County. I'm Senator Alice Nitka from Windsor County. I'm Joe Benning from Caledonia County. And I'm Jeanette White from Wyndham County. Thank you. Mr. Gorski, <clears throat> please. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, my name is William Gorski, formerly Davidson. Uh, I attended Kern Hatton from 1983 to 1987. 
and thank you, Senators, for giving me the opportunity to testify today. I support and encourage Vermont legislators to pass Senate Bill 99 to ensure survivors of childhood abuse have a chance for justice and to hold abusers and the institutions that fail them accountable. Uh, the physical abuse at Kern Hatton that we had to endure was a cruel punishment. Uh, we at Kern Hatton were not A plus students. Uh, we were not the best behaved kids. In fact, many of us were the throwaways, the screw ups of society. Uh, Kern Hatton was supposed to be a safe place for us to live, learn, and grow. Uh, my following account of physical abuse at KH. Uh, contains only four examples out of the many examples of abuse that I have endured. So first, I'm going to speak about the broken arm. So in the 80s, while attending Kern Hatton, uh, while play fighting, as us boys often did, uh, staff member Mark W. Davis uh, told us to stop fighting. When myself and another student did not stop right away, he grabbed my arm, put me into... Uh, a arm bar type of hold. Uh, I tried to get away from him and I called him a bad name and that's when he snapped my arm towards my chest and broke it like a twig. Uh, Davis tried to say that I was fine and that if I told anyone that he'd spread my body parts in the dead man's swamp behind one of the cottages at Kern Hatton. Uh, I was very afraid and in a lot of pain uh, when I finally did re report this to my parents who took me uh, for x-rays and, and, and a cast. Uh, when I reported the incident immediately to Deputy Director then, uh, Mr. Paul Quinney, uh, he said he would take care of it. Uh, Davis remained employed at Kern Hatton and no report was ever made to the authorities of the abuse. To this day, I have a permanent nodule on my arm because it was not treated uh, for two weeks. And because of this medical neglect, it didn't heal correctly. Uh, and it's a constant reminder of the abuse that I endured at Kern Hatton. Um, so next I'm going to talk about the pure assault, physical abuse. Uh, because of the lack of supervision, another boy entered a bathroom that I was in and assaulted me and beat, beat me so badly, I ended up in the infirmary. Uh, my stomach hurt so bad and I couldn't use the bathroom. Uh, they kept me there for two days before finally bringing me to the hospital in Bells Falls, uh, where I was found to be impacted. Uh, despite uh, the reporting of the abuse immediately to Mr. Fisher, the student was never reprimanded or removed from Kern Hatton. Mr. Fish, Mr. Fisher promised me that he would take care of it, but no report was ever made to the authorities. So to this day, I don't use public bathrooms because the soap smell, the smell that he used on me uh, just triggers me and causes PTSD. Uh, it, this has also caused me to lose multiple jobs because I did not use public bathrooms. Um, the next incident is the egg incident. My second week at Kern Hatton, I was sitting at the main dining table. Uh, we were enjoying a nice breakfast of eggs and bacon with my brothers. Uh, one of my brothers named John Doe uh, did not like the taste of eggs and pushed them away. Uh, he, he was sent to his room by a uh, Kern Hatton staff member named Mrs. Kelleher. Mr. Kelleher ran out of the kitchen, ran down the hall, and we saw uh, Mr. Kelleher dragging John Doe by his hair. Uh, he was then force fed the eggs by Mr. Kelleher, which scared us all to death. Uh, and he held the head boy's head on the table while he cried. Um, the third example is the lunchroom. There are several accounts of physical abuse while doing the lunch or supper duty at the cafeteria. Uh, one example is Mr. Searles grabbing a kid by the shirt and throwing him in the utility closet. Uh, we heard yelling and crying while we were in there. And when we came out, the boy had red marks all over his face. Obviously, he had been severely beaten. 
And my final account I want to share today is uh, the account of standing in the corner. Uh, when one of us boys would get into trouble, oftentimes the punishment was standing in the corner. Uh, there were no bathroom breaks, no breaks for food, no breaks for water. Uh, hour after hour, we'd have to stand in the corner of the room. I've seen boys collapse from exhaustion from this punishment. I've seen boys wet themselves right there in the corner because they had stood there too long. Uh, not only did they wet themselves, but they were forced to clean it up and then go back to the corner. I've only had to endure the corner punishment once for myself for four hours for not cleaning the bathroom properly. So I was pretty lucky. Uh, these are just a few examples of the type of child abuse that I endured and observed on a daily basis. The abuse uh, has had a lasting impact on my life and trying to cope with it today is very painful. The flashbacks are debilitating and have landed me in the emergency room. Uh, passing Senate Bill 99 will deter abusers and the institutions that hire them and turn a blind eye to abuse from doing so in the future. They need to know that they can't get away with it anymore. Uh, I don't want any other child to have to go through what we went through at Kern Hatton. So I urge you to pass Senate Bill 99. Thank you for hearing me today. Thank you. Are there any questions for Mr. Gorski? I have one question. Were you in the custody of Department of Social and Rehabilitation Services, or DSW, at any point? Or were you just, how were you, why were you sent to Kern Hatton? Was it I was sent to Kern Hatton because uh, I was not a very good student. And uh, um, the public school in Springfield recommended that my, my parents look for a better situation for me. Thank you. Um, can you, um, maybe I could ask him to look back, but are there any records of Kern Hatton reporting uh, the broken arm to authorities? Is anybody aware of any record of them? Nothing has been produced to us and we have sought records. Um, so we haven't seen any report of that to authorities. Uh, my understanding on, beh on behalf of the Senate Judiciary Committee, could we request from the Commissioner of Department of Children and Families that we want to see any records of reports of abuse of Mr. Gorski uh, previously, Davison? Did we, did we do that, Eric? Um, with obviously with his permission to seek that. I'd like to know who was responsible for not not reporting the abuse. So obviously, in the eighties, I'm pretty sure we had mandatory reporting. <clears throat> Somebody failed to do their job. Yeah, I think we can certainly submit the request. I, uh, I'm not sure. That doesn't mean we'll get it, but I think right. we need to demand that information. I, that's one of the places where I'm most concerned is that abuse occurred and it was never reported to the proper authorities, or if it was, the authorities didn't do anything about it. We share your concerns. Is the, is the, question, is the question whether the I'd like to see the records. I'd like to see the records of a report or the lack of a report in the department. I believe at that time it was, are you talking 1980s? I believe at that time it was Department of Social Welfare, but I don't remember. It's DCF now. I think social I, and rehab services is what it was at that time. SRS at that time. Thanks. So any, uh, I just was wondering, you want to know about not any reports of abuse. Right. Of Mr. Gorski. Right. And with there, any not just client. reports by the school, but I, th I would think you'd want to know maybe if they'd heard about it from anybody. If they heard about it from anybody and if what was done about it. And right. 
obviously there are this information that's confidential. Um, we understand that. We want to know what was, you know, there were reports of what was done. They should be provided to Kim um, if they're confidential. Yes, and I appreciate the efforts, um, Senator Sears and, and Mr. Fitzpatrick will we'll coordinate and work collaboratively with you to see if we can somehow unravel and discover these records that haven't been produced to us to date. And I, I also think you'll need to have the year, the range of years that might have occurred within. I think he... Maybe it's already someplace. I think it's already in his testimony, the year that they... In the written. Uh, in the written testimony. Thank you, Mr. Gorski. Appreciate your testimony. Yeah. Very Thank much. you. Thank you, Eric. Yeah. Mr. Upton. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you to all the senators here today for taking testimony on Senate Bill 99. I was at Kern Hatton for four years from the fall of 1961 to the summer of 1965. I was sent to Kern Hatton because I had what is now known as extreme dyslexia. That is a learning and communications disability. Much later in my life, I learned as part of my extreme dyslexia I was also developmentally disabled. By the second year, I was also at Kern Hatton because of a broken home. I was 11 to 15 years old while I was at the school. And now I'm 71 years old. Today, there is no recourse for the physical assault that so many people suffered when they were children like myself and unable to help themselves. Many people never ever tell anyone about their abuse, but some finally come to terms with it and they process it as I have been doing during just the past few months. To find that there is nothing out there that they or myself can do about physical abuse because of an arbitrary statute of limitations is extremely devastating and only serves to re-traumatize the survivors like myself. And it protects the abusers and the institutional enablers. But now, because of Senate Bill 99, there's an opportunity to help those children like I was to avoid perpetration in the future. With perpetrators and institutions knowing there's an option for civil liability for harming children, they will wind up treating children better. I have been aware for many years that Kern Hatton affected my life in a lot of bad ways. I've always shrugged it off and said to myself, well, I'm strong, I'm manly, and I just moved on with my life. And I focused on my work and I focused on my business. Up to this point, I've been doing just that, but maybe I have not done as well as I thought, all these years. Maybe this pandemic has allowed others to also address the horrors 
of what has happened in their past lives. And for those who have not or cannot, maybe I can help in some way to be their voice. When I was at Kern Hatton around the spring of 1964, I clearly remember someone saying to me, if you stay here more than three years, it will have a very dramatic effect and be very bad for the rest of your life. Institutional living in your formative years will be very bad for you. All through my life and to this very day, I've had many, many flashbacks of that moment and that statement. I remember right where I was standing at Kern Hatton when that statement was made to me. As I have gotten older, I learned more about life. I would say a lot of what I personally experienced while living at Kern Hatton would be unacceptable today. But maybe, and just maybe, it was actually unacceptable even back then. There was no rule book when I was at Kern Hatton. They just told me what to do and what not to do. But they did not tell me everything. I can only include in this testimony a small portion of the experiences that affected me tremendously while I was at Kern Hatton. The worst of it, I cannot describe or express right here in this forum. In an attempt to, in an attempt to heal myself, I have written a very detailed description of all the abuse and activities that I experienced and witnessed while I was at Kern Hatton, including a very detailed description of how the abuse has severely affected my entire life. Simply put, in summary, throughout the four years I was at Kern Hatton. I personally experienced with other boys, men and women, the following. Forced and violent oral sex. I was a forced naked punching bag with my hands tied multiple very hard face slappings, hard naked spankings with my hands tied, naked whippings while tied to trees, forced exhibition showers, forced naked gym activities, and very invasive medical examinations. After some of the abuse, I was threatened with extreme beatings. And I was threatened with being sent to boy prison if I told anyone. Because of my extreme dyslexia, combined with being developmentally disabled, the physical and sexual abuse that I was subject to created a far more devastating effect. I'll, I'll stay with it. It created a far more devastating effect on my entire life. 
this subject is the only thing that gets me emotional. Other than that, I control a lot of stuff, and control a lot of people and make a lot of things happen. This issue is the only thing that makes me emotional. I also personally observed other boys being physically and emotionally abused. I also continually was told of naked physical abuse of other boys. Constantly told of that. It was also unjustified discipline when I was at Kern Haddon. Boys had to stand in the corner and sit for hours. They had to sit or stand for hours in the corner with little, even if they did hardly anything, very little excuses in the corner for two hours, standing. There were boys standing and sitting in the corners a lot with no food and no drinks. Sometimes the same boy had to do it for several hours, three or four days in a row. They also made boys stand with their arms stretched out, left and right with books. Then when the books became too heavy, the boys had to stand there with just their arms stretched out for another half hour. The house parents would also keep changing the rules. So boys never knew what was right or what was wrong. They would tell boys one thing, then say, I never told you that. So now a boy had to sit or stand in the corner again, even more times. Now, later in life, I learned that in prisons, to control the inmates in prisons, the guards intentionally change the rules, even daily. They say things like, I told you that, even when they have not said that. So it turns out that it is used as a control method in prisons. But Kern Hatton, Kern Hatton was not a boy's prison. The boys were orphans. At the time that I was there, a good amount of them were orphans. They were from broken homes or just had learning disabilities like myself. When I was at Kern Hatton, most, if not all of us, in the time that I was there, most of us were pretty good kids for the most part. We all got along kind of well. The out of control discipline by some of the Kern Hatton house parents just never made any sense. Now I could go on with more details of horrific abuse that I had and others went through, but it's more than likely not appropriate to go into those details in this setting. My four years of abuse at Kern Hatton has come rushing back all over again, like a tidal wave in just the past few months. After reading the Kern Hatton statement on the Kern Hatton website, just this last October, and then reading about the Kern Hatton abuse online, I have been reliving this abuse every walking every waking and sleeping moment right to this day. It just doesn't stop. It won't go away. When I go to bed at night, I think about it. At three in the morning, I wake up, I'm thinking about it. And then in the morning, I'm thinking about it. I wish I had never read that statement on that website. I just stumbled into it without the details. I am being re-victimized all over again for four years of abuse, all rolled into just a few months. Four years of abuse 
all rolled into four months in these last few months. All of our survivors need a structure to be able to process the road to get accountability. The process will deter further abuse. It will deter institutions that currently let them run free and wreak havoc on children's lives and their futures. In my mind, it is inconceivable that people like myself so severely physically abused have no access to judge justice. But I am very encouraged by the Senate Bill 99. It will provide sexual and physical abuse survivors the same rights. A lot of what I went through that was combined. There was sexual abuse with physical abuse taking a place at the same time. What jury, what judge, who's gonna figure out where that line is? That's the reason this has to happen. Authoritative research has shown that most children never experience abuse. I'll say that again, because it's so important. Authoritative research has shown that most children never experience abuse and never even know that abuse is going on around them. But the remaining average 30% can be subjected to varying degrees of abuse from mild to really very extreme. Of those of us that have been abused, Many will never speak about it at all. And then there are those who committed suicide because they could not cope with the trauma <clears throat> that was inflicted on them. And yet others, they died because of overdose as a result of self-medicating to deal with the pain. If it weren't for this current virus pandemic that we're all going through right now, my voice more than likely would have never been heard. To cope with my abuse at Kern Hatton and like so many others that go through this, I became an extreme 24 seven workaholic. My whole life, has been running forward. <laughs> and never looking back. When that happens, you go fall. You never want to look back for any reason. Why was that done to me? So when I stumbled into the Kern Hatton website statement, I was shocked. I was actually heartbroken. There was some good at Kern Hatton. It was like a home. To a degree, I'm one of those conflicted people. I love it, but there was a lot of bad. There was <coughs> I found out that Kern Hatton had become like the Kirk. I found out that Kern Hatton had become like all the Catholic orphanages and boarding schools. I was in shock. And I have always thought that I was the only one that had dark secrets of physical and sexual abuse at Kern Hatton. It turns out that now I'm one of many, many others in the state of Vermont. What a shock. So to testify here today, I testify as a voice for the past kids. There's a lot of kids out there who have gone through what I've gone through. But I also testify here today for the present kids. There are a lot of kids right now in home situations, in foster care situations, 
in other institutions, in residential care situations, those kids. What's gonna to happen to them in the future when somebody says, sorry, the time has run out? And then I also testify today for the kids in the future. There are future generations of kids who will also go through this. What happens to them when the time runs out? So I urge you with all the passion that I have, pass this bill, 99. So doing will allow survivors of abuse to take the negative experience and then turn it into positive for the future of children at Kern Hatton and throughout Vermont. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for letting me speak here today. No, thank you. I can only imagine how difficult this has been. Um, appreciate your testimony um, and recognize how heartfelt it is. And uh, Kim, uh, thank you. Um, I'm curious just to know if there's any support group that's been formed among the survivors. Um, similar to the one, I don't know if you saw the testimony yesterday, the, the, some of the survivors of the current ad, I mean of St. Joseph Orphanage had gotten together and formed a support group. And um, we just funded that with $25,000 um, wow. in state money to help with that. And, I offer if you can put together something similar. Uh, three members of this committee are on the Senate Appropriations Committee. I know we'd be more than happy to try to provide some funding to work, to provide a support group where these folks can recognize that they're not alone and that um, there is support. I mean, I um, I ran residential programs for almost 40 years, by the way, small group. Um, <clears throat> and I know the, you know, so I'm familiar with some of the things that you're talking about, but um, this is, uh, Senator <clears throat> That is very gracious. And I think we would appreciate the opportunity to do that. Mr. Upton and I actually just very recently were talking about this and talking about trying to find an actual expert in what's called boarding school syndrome. So we have started these discussions and have started to look for someone who could actually um, run an expert who actually could run the support group that has the skill set to help everyone through and process. So this is something that has been very close to us in our hearts and in our minds. I've spoken with other clients about this as well. So uh, we would appreciate anything that the Senate can do to help fund that. That was one of our concerns. We were talking about how do we find someone who will take different types of insurance um, and different factors that we have to go through to ensure that we could run this correctly. Uh, uh, Eric, you sent a link yesterday, I believe, to, to myself and others um, for the St. Joseph Orphanage. Uh, I'm not recalling that. Who sent me that? <laughs> <laughs> Wait, I, don't I, think get, it was... I get so many emails that I forget who they came from. Um, yeah, that one wasn't me. Sorry, Senator Sears. That's all right. Thank you, Eric. Uh, Kim, I'll try to send Peggy a copy of the link. Um, it's to the. Um... That, that would be incredible, Senator Sears. We have been working with each and every one of the survivors to help them individually and make sure that they have um, therapists or counselors individually. But I do think, and I've spoken with many of them that would like it to be more of a support group of people, their peers that have experienced the same thing. So this has been something, a project that we've just started working on in terms of trying to find an expert. The funding was definitely a concern that we had, but I, if the Senate is able to do anything 
anything, we would really appreciate it. I think it will really help a lot of people heal <clears throat> because they're the emotional impact of this had, they they truly need that. Um, and I think having each I other. I just sent a link to Peggy. It's the Vermont, it's the St. Joseph Orphanage Task Force Investigation. Um, and it's, oh yeah, uh, Bryn said, that's on the website actually under reports and resources. Bryn said that, that was, If you could just send it to Kim, that would be sure. She has a link to it. Um, may or may not be helpful, but if you can get something to us in the next two weeks, that would be helpful. Yeah, absolutely. We really appreciate the support. Um, helping them heal in this way, it will be. Well, really I, I think, you know, I've, I've always found uh, enough about me. Um, uh, Carolyn um, Blake Bashaw is our next witness. Carolyn, welcome to Senate Judiciary. Thank you for coming forward. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you just, hear me? Yeah, we can hear you, Carolyn. Okay. All right. Well, uh, my case is somewhat different and, and somewhat very much alike. Um, I was at Kern Hatton uh, from 1951 to 1954. And uh, I just turned 81 years old. And I did a wonderful job at burying the bad side of Kern Hatton. I was so excited about having a bed to sleep on, food to eat, and all those things that children need. I had been walking the streets of Bellows Falls, you know, um, taking fruit off the trees, going to school with no food. I weighed 62 pounds at 12 years old, and I was very anemic. And I had severe nosebleeds quite frequently. And uh, so I don't want to drag this out a long time. I'd like to run over a few facts and go through this with you about my experience there and everything. My mother dropped me off. She had threatened to put my brother and I into Kernhattan for quite a long time. So I felt like I was being punished going there you know um, my brother Harold he was a couple years younger than me she dropped me off there with a little bag of clothes shoes and a couple of things and left me in the front hall standing there she never came back I never saw her leave and I was standing there and uh, in shock you might say not knowing what to do and I heard the cook speak out she said, not another Blake. There was seven of us that went to Kern Hatton. I was number seven out of 15 children. And I was in five different foster homes. I was a state child. My mother had gone to court to get my brother and I on the state of Vermont. And uh, so anyway, I'm standing there and this woman comes out. She tells me to get the um, get things together, my bag and stuff, and that I am to clean the stairs and do all that. And I don't want to go into a lot of detail. But anyway, it's all in the report that you have. So I got this slap across the face because I asked another little girl where to find things to clean the stairs, which I was told to do. And it wasn't just a slap. It was a hard hit. My head spun around. And I'll tell you, I was in such a state of shock that I started screaming and Miss Ward came out with her adhesive tape two inches wide and tore off a piece and put it over my mouth. My nose was blood because I'd been crying and I could hardly breathe and I stood there gasping for air. Well, anyway, so what happened was that um, you know, I'm beginning to feel anxiety right now talking, just talking about this. So, so what happened was she came out after a while and she ripped that off my face and it hurt really bad. Like I had bad burn you'd get, you know? Yep. So then, um, anyway, uh, I want to jump over to some other things. I had a severe nosebleed and, uh, Mrs. Ford, the one that had slapped me, she took me upstairs and she put my head on the floor and my feet up in a chair. 
and the blood was running down my throat. And uh, she let me choke and gasp, and all of a sudden the blood clot formed and almost choked to death. And I was so petrified, you know. I had, and so she finally let me up. And uh, those those uh, nosebleeds, by the way, gradually disappeared as I got to where I could eat and have a good diet and everything. They finally went away, you know. And this standing online, I had to stand online one night for eight hours. Eight hours. I wasn't allowed to go to the bathroom. I wasn't allowed to do anything. And the other kids were all sleeping while I was standing there. So I do go along with this standing online business. And I stood more than once, you know. And then I was forced to eat foods that I I just couldn't stand, like grapefruit and turnips and stuff. And I was forced to sit there until I threw up. I would throw up. And, uh, of course, I was punished by scrubbing huge kitchen walls and uh, different things with my hands using okite, which burned your hands. And I fell from the swing, cracked collarbone, and severe pain. They didn't take me to the doctors for two days. And no meds, no meds. <clears throat> two, two abscess ears, screaming overnight from pain. No meds. And uh, they held off from taking me to the doctors until the pus was coming out of my ears. And uh, it, and I can go on and on and on, you know. Um, but anyway, so I was led to believe as a small child that abuse was a normal thing. This is part of life. I, I didn't know any different, you know, 12 years old. And, and uh, I thought that this is the way you're supposed to live. I'd seen abuse before with my mother and dad and different things and um uh, you know, it was I wasn't put in a place to change anything, of course. So I just, uh, you know, took it all, and and to the point of where even in the foster homes I was abused because I thought this is normal, and there was a lot of abuse in the state of Vermont going on for children at that time because you were to be seen and not heard. <clears throat> you weren't allowed to speak up and say anything. There were no psychologists to help you nothing and so I just you know stood up with my pulled up my bootstraps and I went on you know and I I uh, married three abusive men who one of them tried to choke me to death you know I thought this is the way life was supposed to be and so I did my very best to do the best I could I went into the air force and um and I was so proud and everything, and I was, I was in basic, and uh, there were certain triggers that I would have these anxiety attacks, and I'd had these from childhood. I didn't know where they come from. You know, I never connected the two, and uh, finally, I decided I had to get out, and at that time, women were allowed to get out because it wasn't wartime or anything, and uh, so I uh, went to the top of brass worked up the chain of command to her, and she said my tests were so high, they were going to put me into IBM, and uh, they, and she begged me to stay in, but she said she couldn't keep me in there. Finally, she agreed. After I told her I was having nightmares about current happening and different stuff, she agreed to let me out, and they gave me an honorable discharge, and I'm covered by everything that, you know, service people are covered by you know, VA and all of that, you know. But um, so anyway, after I got out, got married and everything, I went back to Kern Hatton. I was searching for the love that I wanted so desperately as a child. And even today, I'm still searching. 81 years old. I want that love, that love that children need to grow, you know. And I think of as a tree is bent, so grows the tree, you know. And uh, so what I did was, uh, 1968, I started getting involved with Kernan. I supported them financially, and I became, uh, you know, vice president to the alumni. And I gave all my time and energy I could to Kernan, and I did it to help the kids that were there. And I had put this other thing in the background. 
until this last October. So when I heard about this, then it all come flooding back. And I started to cry at my age. I started to cry. And I said, I stood there and I watched my brothers and sisters, the seven of us had been in there, pass away. And one wrote a book, No Mom, No Pa. And he tried desperately to get Kern Hatton's attention about the abuse and everything. And they shredded it. They got his only copy and they shredded it. And they told me that they had destroyed all of the current records. They were gone. And I wanted my records. I wanted to know, uh, you know, about my past medical stuff and like that. And then later on, I heard the medical records from uh, the Bell Falls Hospital were, were all destroyed. So uh, I put that away. I said, well, I'll just keep going on. And um, I started to express a little bit about, I had a TV program about politics and different things. And I started to express a little bit about Kern Hatton, but I never got into it deeply. I always backed away from it. And I said to myself, I will go to my grave with this. There's no time limit. There's no time limit because that little girl is still inside of me. The child that we are is still there. And um, I tried to ignore the fact that I couldn't go into bathrooms and lock the doors in public places. I felt trapped. And uh, also, when I feel uncomfortable in a crowd and I had to get out of there and and run away and things like that, you know. And there were just things like this. But I kept bouncing along and I kept uh, and I started to you know, go to church, and that was a staple for me, and it kind of helped me along the way, and, uh, but anyway, you know, this is a, I'd like to close it out with this, my final thoughts, there's no healing for the abused when there's no accountability. I now, as a widow, have time to reflect and process what has happened to me. It takes time to build courage and face whatever abuse you've had you know and we all as children handled it in different ways and in different time limits you know many taken this abuse to the grave in my family abuse needs to stop and no case should be dismissed due to timely limits the shock i felt has never been dealt with that sixth grade anemic little girl 62 pounds didn't need this treatment, you know. And the funny thing was, when I would bring anything up about changing anything at current at alumni meetings, it was all dismissed. Or they'd take me out to eat, and they'd put pressure on me to change my mind. And and I found that, like, I wanted the alumni to have their own uh, their own little bank account separately from current at Oh, no, we can't do that. The alumni money's got to go in with the current hat and money and things like that. And I tried to defend the alumni and stuff. And I soon found out that there was an element of people there running it like it was a business. And we were sent out to sing to other people like the Rebecca's and women's clubs and stuff. And then they would receive money. Yet that's how they made a lot of their money and everything. And, you know, and I started to think about all these things and how Kern Hatton today is is a business. It's a huge, huge business. And it had all these funds. And believe me, I gave a lot of money to that school. And it was hard for me to step forward like this and tell you all these things. But what these other two have said is absolutely true because my brothers shared it all with me. And, um, you know, I just want to thank you today for letting me open up and expose all of this stuff because, you know, there are other children coming along. And these things have been covered over for so many years. And I thank Kern Hatton for the food. I thank them for the bedding, the toothbrushes, the shoes, and, uh, you know, this little barefoot little kid that walked the streets of North Washington. 
of those falls and had absolutely nothing to eat. The teachers used to put food in my desk at school because they knew I had a problem. And I thank God that I made it this far. And I just want to say, please, please think about what you're doing before you make this decision. Please do it for the sake of all those that will be coming down the pike like I did. And uh, you've been so wonderful to me today just to listen. And I just praise God for you. And that's my story. Thank you very much. And thank you very much. Thank all of you for the testimony. Kim, thank you for arranging this. We will um, be doing markup of S99, which means we will start to make some decisions about the bill um, later, if we have time later on today, but we'll also be looking at it next Wednesday at around I think 10.45 a.m. So uh, Kim and anyone else who wants to join us at that time, just feel free to hang. We have one more witness, uh, Emily, who we're gonna hear from shortly after a 10 minute break. And we'll be back at 20 minutes after 10. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, were there any questions of Carolyn from the committee? Thank you so much to all of you, uh, Ray, Carolyn, and Bill, or William. Thank you so much, and Kim. Um, yeah. Appreciate it. Look forward to hearing.